How can hunters and property owners do big things on a small scale? We discuss hunting small acreage, family, and more with our guest coming up next on the Rack Factor Podcast. Welcome to the Rack Factor Podcast, where we discuss the factors that lead to bigger bucks and a healthier deer herd. The Rack Factor Podcast is presented by Rack Fuel Premium Deer Nutrition. From premium deer mineral to deer feed, premium food plot seed to deer attractant, Rack Fuel products maximize the health and potential of your deer herd year round. Visit rackfuel.com and fuel your herd. Our guest today is a man on a mission. He brings new meaning to the phrase, do more with less, and he focuses on teaching others how to improve deer habitat on smaller tracts of land. Ty Miller of Small Acre Hunting joins us on the Rack Factor podcast. And Ty, hey, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate the invite from you guys. For those wondering why it looks like Tom's been crying, it isn't because he missed a big buck. Why don't you explain what happened? So I got home a little earlier than uh, normal today, and and I was helping my wife with the last batch of of salsa. And I, for everyone that knows me, I like spicy stuff. So I was in charge. I cut all the habaneros, all the jalapenos, all the chili peppers. I washed my hands like 12 times, soap and water. And uh, literally right when I sat down and got on with Steve, I rubbed my eye and... <laughs> God, my whole face just swelled up. My my eyes are burning. And they uh, they both said when we started talking at first uh, that they're doing better than they deserve. And I'm like, I probably got what I deserve. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's definitely a little better right now. But uh, that was hot. That burned for sure. Eyes are a little puffy. So, but Yeah, a little puffy. That matches the rest of me. So you are a Viking fan, so puffy eyes is a normal thing. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm not. I am not. <laughs> I'm not from I here. I know, but I always got to pretend you are. <laughs> no, I know. That's all right. I get a bunch of crap for it, but uh, that's that's okay. They did beat your team, though, on the first week. <laughs> so you, you, you did bring that up. <laughs> Fair game. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ty. So what are you looking forward to the most now that hunting season's here? Hopefully just some time up in the tree to be able to relax. Uh, Life's been just a little crazy. And uh, hunting always provides that escape that I think only those that are listening and those that share the woods and the fields with us can really understand what that means. It just it's a way to recharge the batteries, unlike any place that uh, I think God created. I absolutely agree. So your niche is kind of uh, guys and gals that that hunt small hunting parcels. So yeah. before we kind of get into that, what basically is your definition of what a small acre hunting parcel is? So it's going to vary depending on location, habitat, terrain, and things like that. But, you know, I grew up hunting on a seven acre piece of woods behind my family's house. So, I mean, I have consulted this year alone on two properties that were sub 10 acres. And uh, so, you know, but whenever people ask me that question, I know it stinks to say the it depends, but it really does. But easily under 100 acres, um, rarely do I get asked to come and help a guy out uh, with his property designs if it's over 100 acres. So we're talking 20 to 40 acres is really the groove zone where a lot of guys come to me for. I think the biggest one I went on this year or consulted with uh, digitally was like 75 acres. So that 20 to 40 is a, kind of your sweet spot? Yeah, my personal property that I've owned now since 2016 is just a, just a hair under 23 acres. Um, and my pops, who we'll talk about later, and anybody that knows me, recognize the name pops my father he just bought a 29 acre river bottom piece so which is actually big for us we've never owned anything that big which is crazy i know to many but (laughs) that's our life it's what we were dealt and we've made the most of it right so for those that don't know you or follow you where are you located and and what why are you hunting these smaller tracks out of necessity So I grew up and still reside in the northern part of Indiana. For those who uh, 
the closest place would probably be Notre Dame, South Bend. People will recognize, so kind of dead center. I'm only about 30 minutes from the Michigan line. So anybody that knows the area, it's a pretty populated area. So we don't have really large, massive chunks of, uh, of land and acreage. I think the largest parcel, uh, single parcel at Elkhart County, which is where I live, it's something like 400 acres. There might be people that own more than that, more parcels, but we're really a subdivided up area. And I didn't grow up in a home that had a lot of money or, or large property. So it was really one of those things where once I got into hunting, I hunted what I had, started knocking on doors, and it's a lot easier to gain access on five to nine acres that nobody else wants to bother with than, uh, than getting on that 90 acre piece that we all want to hunt. Right. So what are some of the main challenges that a small acre hunter faces when they've got their boots on the ground? Everything's magnified. Every single thing that all of us deal with, no matter what the size of the property is, our mistakes are magnified because you're hunting a very micro area. You know, the, the trying to get on the top 10% of the bucks in your area, which is what I try to target, which is typically a four or five year old in my area is uh, getting up there due to the pressure and everything. But the biggest challenge is just the fact that if you slip up just once, your whole property could be blown. It's not like if you own a 400 acre lease or 200 acre lease and you kind of get that edge of the bedding area a little squirrely. No, if you mess up an area on your small property, it's toast and you may never see that target buck that you're after again. Um, it is very rare that I lay eyes during the hunting season on any of my target bucks more than one time. And I just hope to capitalize it. And so far I have, I probably just ruined that for this year, but you know, (laughs) hopefully not. So on your, on your website and uh, on podcasts, you talk about uh, removing disturbances um, quite a bit. What do you mean by that? So that's, that's going to be a long, long thing to kind of get through, but a lot of it is going to be controlling the hunter controlling the deer and controlling other people. Um, A lot of the times when you deal with small acres, you're going to be dealing with a lot of people that just assume it's a free for all, or you're dealing with more people around you. So you have to be extremely strategic in how you lay out your property, where you want deer to be able to traverse. You know, there are trying to think on my property, I have two property edge lines that are completely blocked. Um, I don't want deer or humans or anything going in. Um, So that's kind of going to the extreme of controlling that disturbance. And I also use that as a back wall for bedding. You know, it's funny, deer will bed really close to where there might be activity, especially when you get into smaller properties and they'll use it as a security buffer. They know nothing's going to come, but they can hear it coming. And actually Cicero, who's right over my right shoulder, he bedded eight feet from a chain link fence half the time, um, Hmm. right next to a, uh, uh, I'll just say a commercial facility because people will probably figure out. Um, I've, I've had right. I've had people figure that out before, but he was a buck that he loved to bed close to danger, but I had to give him those slip trails. I had to give him a spot that he felt safe during the day. You know, it goes to how you lay out your food plots, where you have the deer traversing your property. You know, I I, I like to try to say I try to make my property be that unhunted paradise that that old lady down the street owns that doesn't allow anybody to hunt that we all try to get property next to. I try to make my place that because I don't have the luxury of giving deer their entire belly full at night. They're leaving my property at night. You know, when you're talking small properties, you're not holding deer, but I want to hold them during the day. I want to hold them when I can hunt them, when I can keep them alive and attract them to my property. So I do everything and anything I can to give them the property as much as I possibly can. And a lot of that's controlling the person. If you can't control you, it's useless. So, I mean, how do you, I mean, this is to me the most important question of, of, of everything is, is, is how do you hunt those mature bucks on a small piece of property and not overpressure them? So almost every single time I start a conversation with people, it is you always have to have 
what I call burn properties or what I call my, my freezer properties. I'm not going to hunt my place if I don't think I have a shot at my target buck or bucks. I just won't even go. I don't, I don't do observation sets. I don't go to see what's happening. I learn my property and I hunt it only when everything is right. I'll go hunt my other places. I'll fill up a freezer. Um, I'll go to public. If I had public close by, a lot of my clients, you know, they, they get to learn public through the process. When you're hunting small properties, you hunt a lot less or you should hunt a lot less because, you know, every time you go to a property, you're leaving a story behind that the deer have to interpret. Whether they interpret it as danger, old news, bad news, good news, you know, they're going to interpret it. So I try to limit my entire access, limit my number of hunts. I only hunt the edges of my property. Um, it's very rare that you will find a stand 40 yards, 50 yards in from an edge that I can access quickly. Um, I want my property to be a sanctuary. Uh, I will try to do all I can for entrance and exit protection. Uh, I think that is just one of the biggest things that you can hear me preach all the time is entrance and exits destroy a property. So on my small acre properties, some of my entrance trails, like the one I'm going to tomorrow that I actually shot him out of, it's only once I cross onto my property, 12 yards, but it is a tunnel that I've created with hinge cuts. I had a couple old tires. I mean, I've literally made it to where I can creep in there and up that tree and there's no chance of any crossing, no nothing. I only hunt east winds. I only hunt when everything's right. That's the biggest key that a lot of my clients can't figure out is they hunt too much or they hunt the wrong stand. Um, you know, I have a saying that every single property that I've been on or every single property out there has a stand that you should not hunt. I bought my property March of 2016 in April. I hung a stand in my favorite spot. It's still in that tree. I've never hunted it because I can't justify the sacrifice getting to it. So how far in is that one? So that one from the point that I would enter to it would be about 210 yards. So you'd be going deep in, into the, to the piece deep as far as my property goes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. I'd actually, cause I don't have, it's actually on an edge. It's only about 18 yards from my one border but I cannot access from that side. Okay. And I just cannot sacrifice it, but I can't bring myself to bring it down either. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is the perfect location. It's right on the edge of a little bedding. I got, it's right in the middle of a triangle bedding triangle. And I'm like right in the middle of where this circuit happens. I've got trail cam pictures that prove it every year, but just can't justify it. So I won't go in. But I keep enhancing that area. I give them a bunch of licking branches. Um, I've got a couple chestnut trees that are finally high enough. I've got a couple scrapes that I set up and I monitor it. You know, that's another thing. I think guys only work on locations in their property with them in mind, not the deer. On small properties, I want to maximize every square foot. So there's a lot of times where I will put in even micro plots knowing I'll never hunt it. But I'm giving that deer safety, security, a place to nibble before they go off my property or when they come back onto my property or during those midday times. So does, does that piece, does that have water on it? It does. The piece that I bought has a pond. If like, so my property is like a big rectangle with a little square at the top and right in the middle of my rectangle, it's like a keyhole is a pond. The okay. ponds, the ponds only 15 yards wide, maybe. But it runs, you know, that whole about 65% of the length of my property. It really kind of serves as a good separation point. I've got, you know, you get your matriarchal does that don't get along every now and then I can have two doe groups that really call the place home because that pond kind of separates them out. Okay. You talked a little bit about how you've created a barrier tie on, on, a couple of sides of your property. How did you do that? What did, how did you incorporate that? What, what practices did you use? I'm a hinge cutter. 
I will. I, I, I am not anti hinge cutting by any means. They are one of the best living hedges that we can use to blockade deer block movement. We can also use them to feed deer. So I used everything from actual fencing, you know, putting up and, and fixing an old barbed wire fence that was already there. We had a logger come through. So after the logger came through, I hinged over a bunch of trees. Now, when I'm trying to block those trees, I'm of course hinging. I don't want them any higher than like my waist. I want it to be an actual obstruction to where a deer doesn't even want to jump into it. Um, and obviously trespassers are usually lazy. They're not going to come through it either. Um, I've had major trespassing issues on my property. So that whole border became a real big issue one summer when I filed six trespassing charges on two, two or three people. So I just finally said enough's enough and went up there and started hinging fixing fence. And then when the logger got done, I had him or I dragged some treetops over in front of him as well. So, and it's amazing. Once that was up, I went back about two weeks later just to see, and there was already deer beds. Cause when I came back out, I tried to make, and I raked out some areas and like where the treetops made V's so where they could kind of nook up in there and deer were already calling it home. Nice. That's awesome. So what land management practices do you think are the most important for holding or keeping mature bucks, either betting on your small parcel or coming back to it? Especially on small parcels, don't worry about food. You know, everybody, food plots are fun. I love them. I'm addicted to them, but it's one of the last things that you should try to figure out. Um, You can provide just an insane amount of food if you just get your property thick. Uh, Early successional growth, You know, if you've got open, if I can drive a Ford Ranger or my four wheeler through your woods, you need to have a logger come in. You've got to eradicate the canopy. You've got to get it thick. Deer don't want to live in a deer desert, as I call it. You know, everybody loves oak flats. They love acorns, but there's nothing for the deer to live in. You know, if I had a hundred acres, I'd protect a lot of my open hardwoods. It's oftentimes great hunting, but on a small property, I want, again, to maximize every square inch, which means I'm going to get my property to be that thick, nasty jungle, except for the pockets where I've got micro plots that I figure out later and where I can hunt them and kill them. I'm going to get that property thick. So canopy eradication, getting early successional growth, that is the key to getting a small property firing on all cylinders. And then from there, you can carve in your, your, your candy, you know, your cherries on top, get those micro plots firing and entrance and exits. I, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't, you can't sell a stand short with a bad entrance and exit. Honestly, your entrance and exits, they're everything. They really are. There's no good to having a stand. And we already touched on that. I'm just circling back, but yeah, I mean, that's a big thing, but yeah, it doesn't take much pressure to, to shift a mature buck onto your neighbor's property or even, you know, turn them nocturnal. Right. Yep. So what is the one thing hunters overlook the most when doing land management on the ground they hunt, in your opinion? I think just the concept of leaving a place alone creates a bedding area. I see that a lot. Guys, guys, are, oh, that, that 20 acres over there, or that 10 acres over there, we don't go there. That's our sanctuary. That's where they bed. And it's like, well, let's go walking in there. Let's go figure this out. And, you know, we, I'm like, let me know when we're in there. And they're like, well, we're in it. And it still looks like open hardwoods. It still looks like just a barren desert. And it's like, if you were a deer, where are you hiding? Right. Where do you feel safe? Right. You know, I don't think many guys when they really start, when they actually are blessed to own a property to make better understand and really put themselves in the shoes of deer. You know, I always use the term, you want to make everything accessible for them from your, uh, your feet to your armpits. If it's not there, they can't touch it and they can't use it. The only thing that's beneficial outside of that is acorns when they fall and that's seasonal. You've got to get your property firing on all cylinders in that groove zone where they can actually use it, where they can hide in it, where they can eat in it. You know, you're actually creating a sanctuary and then you're going to hunt the edges of it, create your entire property like that. 
So the guys like you're talking about, they're basically, because they're not going in to hunt a certain area, they're just considering that a sanctuary. Yep. Is that basically yeah. what you're saying, right? No, I'm just saying not, not doing the work to actually make it, you know, better and, and make it something where the deer are going to feel safe and, and, and an actual sanctuary. They're just, okay, this is a spot we're not going to go in and that's our sanctuary. Um, yeah, that makes sense. You yep. can't do it that way. And you've got to always be thinking, how can I enhance this? Right. Just like us as human beings, there's always a better step, a better decision, something that we can do to make ourselves a better. I haven't seen a bedding area yet that can't be enhanced. That includes my own. If I had endless amounts of time, mine would be leap years better. You know, there's always things you can do. There's always something that you can cut there's a hinge cut here there's a girdle here you know there's clearing a path here that they already want to do but you got a down tree you got to do those things to make that bedding area a 10 out of 10 right so on on these smaller pieces um how many stands typically are you you hanging it on uh on something like that uh I, my personal property I have four stands on. Okay. One of those is the one that I know I'll never go to. <laughs> so you've got three st- actual three. stands that you have. I, I have three actual stands and two of them are only about 50 yards apart. They're hunting very similar movement, but one of them really focuses on one specific East West travel corridor that bucks like to use out of a bedding area off my property. Okay. If I have a buck doing that, then I move to that one. If not, I actually hunt the other one because it's a shorter entrance exit, less disturbance. So earlier you said that, uh, that you hunted on it on the East wind Are are all those, all three stands set up for an East wind or no. So I got one, one for Easterly winds. Okay. Um, and then the other two are actually on the East side of the property. Um, so I hunt mainly north winds because okay. if it gets too much west wind, it actually kicks into a bedding area off my property. So I can't flirt too much with that. If I do want to hunt a west, I do actually have a ground blind on the very southern edge of my property um, that, that overlooks the southern extreme of my largest food plot, which is only three quarters of an acre that connects to another three quarter of an acre. Um, so I have that blind, if you will, as well. Okay. Okay. But I love east winds. East winds, historically, I see deer doing dumb things. So do you get that that wind very often? Or, or nope. is that just a couple times a year that you're going to get that and, and, and take advantage of it then? We actually have uh, east, northeast, north, northeast tomorrow for opening day. And it's going to be 40 degrees in the morning. So that's... Those are two factors that I'm actually, I'm actually going to go in the morning tomorrow, which I never have done. I've never hunted my place opening day. Um, I've only hunted before October 10th on my place once. And that was when I killed him. Uh, So I, I think historically I averaged Tom maybe seven to nine days with an East wind strong enough that I'll actually hunt it. Okay. A lot of the times when East winds are predicted in our areas, it's those light and variable days, which I'm not a fan of. Right. Right. Other than swapping stuff around, you know, how, how do guys, cause I mean, obviously you know what you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you're going to other places, but, but how do other guys that, that only have these small pieces avoid over hunting these, these stands and just hunting them too much. It goes back to, they got to be able to control themselves. Right. And it comes back to, you know, their goals. Do they want to, Do they want to kill deer on the property that they have? Some guys, they're not as picky as me. You know, they'll be happy with any buck with eight, eight points and, you know, a two-year-old. Right. Uh, They can hunt a little bit more. But if you're trying to get that big buck, the biggest buck, you know, one of the two, you're going to have to control yourself. Um, There's nothing. And I tell all my clients, I go, like, if you're just going to do or hunt as much as you want, you're going to ruin your property. If I hunted as much as I wanted. I would ruin my property. You know, a lot of them are dads or have other hobbies. I'm like, go be a dad for a day. Take your kid to the zoo, do whatever you want to do. 
if you know it's not 100% a go day, don't go. And you got to control yourself. Right. Which men in general are bad at. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's where those those burn properties would, would come into to play and, and, and then go on and, and, you know, like you said, getting on some, some public land just to see something different and not, not burn those up. Yeah. All right. Ty, what's your, uh, what's your MO when it comes to mature bucks? How do you, how do you beat one? You've got one on the wall behind you. How did, how did you beat Cicero? Uh, Cicero was about two years worth of data. And then that summer chronicling, I don't think that's a word that I just said, logging (laughs) every single, uh, time that he was using an exact bedding area. Um, the bedding area that he was using was only about two acres in size. So I had multiple cameras coming to and from the food, the micro food to the South of his bed. And I, every time I got him down it was in a spreadsheet what he was doing you know if i got a picture of him could he have possibly come this route and i just started mapping out all these potential routes and it it became very clear that if i got an east wind there was almost a guarantee he was going to bet up there um the problem was i knew this from a neighbor that let me kind of the, the neighbor with the fence let me access his property and I would go and I, I actually spotted him one time in his bed. And I was like, there's no way I'm getting to my stand. He was only bedded about 45, 50 yards from my stand. And you're talking about trying to slip in on a guy that I didn't realize at the time scored 175. He was about, a, I think he was aged at five or six. I can't remember. I'd have to look at the deer lab, but he wasn't going to let me just do that. So I waited till again, everything was right. And it happened earlier than I wanted. It actually happened on October 4th or 5th. I can't remember which day it was. It rained for like 12 hours. And then we had straight east winds with a cold front. So I thought I'm going to take a chance on the buck of probably my life. Hopefully not. Now that, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully Iowa. That's right. We'll change that. Um, yeah. But everything was wet. So that little 12 yard walk in my tunnel, I felt like everything would be quiet. And I was like, I'm not going to take my camera. I, Cause I usually film my hunts. I'm going to limit, limit everything that I possibly can to quiet. And that 12 yards and getting in that stand took me about 45 minutes. <laughs> and he came walking down the path like an hour and a half, two hours before dark. He was just going to come in. He had a mouthful of uh, oats. He was feeding at seven yards from my stand when I shot him. Nice. But it really comes down to those mature bucks trying to figure them out. You're, you're rarely going to figure them out in one year. Um, you might get lucky, but historically, as you begin to stack data and how the mature bucks navigate your property, you begin to see it on every property or your own more and more. And You know, each one's kind of unique. I've had Cicero was a fighter. I have another buck who is still alive. He only has three good legs. He can't fight. So he he beds in only certain locations, and he's only around when I don't have any bully bucks. Um, I'm Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to shoot him someday. It'd be an incredible story. He got hit by by a car, and his one leg is just shot. But he has lived now. He will be... He was a a three-and-a-half-year-old or two-and-a-half-year-old in 16, so he's seven or eight. Okay. Um, But a lot of it comes down to just tracking them, constantly asking questions. Every single picture I got of Cicero or my other buck that I didn't name, actually, that I shot, he he scored a 150-ish. Every picture, every time you get an image of a buck, ask why. Why are they there? Where did they come from? Where are they most likely going? Why did they feel safe? What was the temperature? What was the pre-dawn wind? Like, it's pretty simple stuff, but you just got to go through it and learn it. And you begin to know a buck. They're all unique, just like us humans. And sometimes you get to know one good enough and you're like, yeah, I'm never going to kill you. So I'm going to move on. Other times you start connecting the dots and you're seeing a chance. And that's all we need is a chance. 
Right. So what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned from, from hunting a buck like that? Humility. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> they you tend know. to do that, don't they? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I, for, for every buck I've shot, I could list another five or six that I haven't, you know, and, and, and it's an incredibly emotional roller coaster when it all comes together. You know, it's, it's something that is very hard to describe and you don't feel worthy of an animal like that when you walk up on them, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I do what I do. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not of the industry, but I try to provide and help others as much as I possibly can. And, uh, little bit of a give back, if you will, to hopefully, you know, some of my favorite emails I get are guys that are like, I just shot the biggest buck of my life. Right. You know, there was a guy in Michigan last year. I think he has about 16 acres. Um, I ended up doing his consult for free just because his whole situation, which I won't go into, he probably doesn't want it aired, but he ended up shooting the biggest buck of his life. And, you know, it was just like a 112 inch eight pointer. But I mean, the dude's literally got tears going down his eyes when he's FaceTiming right. me. And it's just like, that's incredible. Right. Like, that buck probably will mean more to me from any consult I ever have just because of the situation. Right. Yeah. That makes it all worth it. All right. We're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about family now. Uh, you're very close with your dad. What's it like when you got that phone call from him that he shot one of your target bucks on the property that you worked on together? So he actually probably shot a buck that had better genetics than any buck I've ever shot on my property. Um, he actually shot it. So I shot Cicero October pop shot, uh, Dovahkiin was his name. And he was basically, I think he was a seven by six or an eight by seven. I mean, he, but he was a young deer, but I mean, it was just tines galore. And, uh, I remember when he texted me, I was at Walmart. I, that cart was gone and I was just running through Walmart. They probably thought I was trying to steal something. Um, I was so happy for him, you know, and it was, it was, it was, it's, I can't, I can't imagine how a father feels. I mean, Tom, you're a dad, Steve, you're a dad. When, when your when your son does something that you're proud of or daughter, like it's incredible. Like, I can only imagine the joy he has when I kill something right? because I know when he kills something, it feels like I did, you know, we hunt as one. I've actually talked about it in podcasts and stuff. You know, if you're going to share hunting property with somebody, you really got to tackle it as one. It can't be like two people are hunting the property. It's got to be like one. And that's the, that's the blessing that I have with my dad. And, uh, it's incredible. I, I hope I keep getting texts and calls that he shot my biggest buck on my property for 20, 30, 40 more years. Right. I guess I have a question on that because you guys are hunting as one and, and hunting the same properties. Um, do you both ever hunt the same property on the same day? It's rare. Um, okay. And I'm trying to think on my property, my 22 I don't believe we could right now as it's set up unless no, I just don't think there would ever be a win situation where we'd want to. Um, I do have a tree stand location that we are going to be hanging. Um, I wanted a little bit, and I wanted another year of recon that if we hang it, there's a reason. And it's because of that. There's two main bedding areas that some of my mature bucks like to use and we could both hunt on an east wind and chances are if the buck went to one of those two bedding areas, one of us would get a shot. Okay. Um, but we do, we do both have a, what I call a freezer property. Although I've shot some good bucks out there. Um, that's the one property that, that we both have hunted at least every year. We usually go hunt together once or twice out there. Okay. Is he all set up now and ready to go on his new property? The, the river bottom property? Unfortunately not. So we bought that property or he bought that property last year and he was going to hunt it one day, but it is a true river bottom. And it, we had unusually high rains and it was just, there was no chance of hunting the stand that we hung. 
Uh, we didn't have much intel on the property at the point that he bought it. So last year really was just a trail camera hunting year, um, getting to know the property through movement. And then this summer was supposed to be a logger. So we weren't going to hang cameras or more stands because then the loggers were going to come in and they were told to take any tree at all. If it wasn't going to cost us to pay them to bring it down, bring it down. Um, we just wanted it out. We want that canopy gone. And uh, that didn't happen. So now we're kind of running behind the eight ball again. But we do have we do have two locations picked out over there right now. And I think he's going to be heading out tomorrow, actually, for an afternoon hunt. Okay. So now that you're a father, you know, you've got a young son. How has, you know, how's hunting changed for you? I have a lot less time to record podcasts, make footage, make videos, go to the property in general. Um, but very willingly, very right. willingly. Um, it's definitely going to, it's definitely cut back on my hunting some for sure, as it should. And I've had a lot of conversations with young men um, on that and fathers that struggle with that. But I guess one thing that I've always thought of, you know, my son didn't get into, didn't get to pick the father that he has. Right. If he had, he probably wouldn't have picked me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. So I've always said he didn't, if he would have gotten to pick a father, he would have picked a father that would be there 12 months out of the year, not nine. Right. So I try not to let my hunting season steal you know, as much from him as possible. And I can't wait to see if he latches onto it. You know, he's still a little young, not going to really take him to a ground blind or anything like that. And I'm also not one that's going to force it on him, you know, knowing my luck, I'm going to be going to, I don't know, band competitions, tennis, whatever it is. And I'm going to love it, but <laughs> you know, I can't wait to see if he takes a liking to the outdoors um, and, and, and that, but yeah, it's definitely changed. It, it means a lot more. Um, I love taking him. He loves taking pictures with the deer. He, he absolutely, anybody that's followed small acre hunting has seen some of the photos that he has put forth, uh, right. jumping up and down, petting the deer. He just, yeah. So we'll see what happens, but it's, it's a joy almost more so now to enjoy it with him in the little ways that he can, you know, he's only three, but I'm seeing glimmers of it. Right. Nice. I think that's all any of us can do is just kind of expose them to it and see whether right. or not they take it, you know, take to it. And, um, f you know, mine, for instance, they're, they're not hunting currently, but hopefully they'll, they'll come back to it someday. Right. I, I, I kind of hope, I kind of hope he gets into wildlife photography or something like that. I could use really awesome photos taken. Like, so <laughs> <laughs> I won't lie. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. That fence kills me every time you take a picture with that deer with the fence in the background. It's, every I know. time, I, I it kill kills some, me. I kill some. <laughs> I, I kill some amazing deer, but I don't have access to a ton of photographic. I mean, one of my favorite photos is in front of a shed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's those are Ty's calling cards though. He's got the fence along his property line. Yeah. You know, people can't get in and out. That's that's I laugh part of every his signature, time. right? <laughs> you need, I need to, get, to like, just find awesome. a cornfield. That or you, you need a green that. screen in the back. There we go. <laughs> Photoshop Lambo field in the background. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, but God. while we're on we're photos. Let me get on my soapbox for like 10 seconds. Anybody listening or watching this, if you have the time to take a photo, wipe the mouth, tuck the tongue, get rid of the blood. <laughs> yeah, that's not very difficult to do. That's worse than a fence, no. Tom. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. I, I jokingly give you crap about the, 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 all those pictures. I just shake my head and just move on yeah. because there's no point really in, in arguing with them because yep. if they cared, they would have they would have done those things. That's the key. You know, they just, they just don't. So we work our butts off for just right. one chance at a deer. Right. Man, soak it in, take pictures that are worth remembering. Right. right. And that doesn't involve the back of a truck usually. No, <laughs> no. Sorry, Steve. I kind of interrupted you there. No. <laughs> no problem. All right, Ty, this is the part of the show we call the lightning round. 
we ask you a series of rapid fire questions and just have you answer them. First thing that comes to your mind. So are you ready? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. He's ready. All right. Question number one. If you could only hunt one day a year, what day would it be? November 5th. Okay. Why November 5? Historical data on pretty much two or three of my main properties. I think if you give me November 5th, there's bound to be a wind happening and a temperature happening that I could make something work. Yeah, that's a good date. I've never killed something on it, but I've always felt like I should have given all the data I have cross-sectioning on that time period. First week of November is always good. All right, next question. What is your favorite venison recipe? Oh, mango habanero brats. Oh, oh that sounds super good. I mean, I probably should have it too today, soon. But... Too soon, Tom? <laughs> the habanero reference? Oh, <laughs> uh, no. It does sound good, though. If I, still, if I still have any in a package, I'll bring some to Iowa for you, Tom. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right, next question. Fixed or mechanical? Fixed. I shoot a two-blade... Uh, single bevel broadhead. So I'm fixed all the way and I'm heavy. It's a 200 grain. Hmm. Did you have a bad experience with a mechanical? I mean, not really. Uh, I mean, I had a bad experience in the sense that it did what it, I tried to make it do what it just couldn't do. And that was to go through a shoulder on a, on a whitetail. I ended up getting the deer. It actually, made it enough and it bled out. I I hit a main artery, Um, but it's nothing against them. That was also back before when I was shooting a really light arrow. So I didn't know any better. Never should have had a mechanical on the front of my broad on the front of my arrow. So I'm not like anti mechanical, like some people, but they'll never be on the tip of my broad or my arrows ever. Next question. Are you superstitious? Yes. Do you have like a special cap that you wear? No. Um, I have been wearing the same transportation clothes for over 10 years, though. Really? <laughs> they have so the, their for own those category. Yeah, so tra- tra- I, have, I have a tote that are only transportation clothes, which means those are the clothes that I put on after I shower. Right. They see the property and I change outside the truck. I have been wearing the same swishy pants. <laughs> They're like the old school <laughs> 1990 swishy pants. Oh, with- I can't wait to see these in <laughs> December. This is going to be great. <laughs> I don't know if I'll, I'll, you know, we're hunting with a boomstick then. So I feel like I'm cheating. So I may not even bring them, but <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I have same transportation clothes as a superstition of mine. If if one of those ever rip or fail, I'm probably going to cry a long, long, sorrowful night. Mm. Okay. All right. Last question, Ty. What is the most important factor in your opinion in killing a mature buck? Patience. Patience, patience while on stand, patience waiting for the shot not a shot and patience to even go hunting as we were talking about. If you, if you lack patience, there's a lot of instances that are going to burn you in hunting and are just going to end up in epic failure. All great answers, man. Thanks for playing the lightning round. So where can listeners find you online? Uh, Small acre hunting.com. Uh, have a Facebook page. There is an Instagram, but it's not very active, full disclosure. And uh, any streaming source of podcasts, whenever I have time to sit down in my unfinished studio and uh, record a podcast. Because we've mentioned it a few times already, a little, you know, a little. How excited are you for the for our Iowa muzzleloader hunt? So I go back and forth. I think I've actually shared a little bit of this, and none of this is going to surprise Tom, but I'm actually – very split. I'm extremely excited. Iowa is the Mecca of whitetails. You know, everybody dreams. There's a reason it takes four to five years to go chase whitetails there with a bow. Um, 
I've never killed a buck with a gun yet. So little apprehensive on that, even though it should be easier. I'm a bow hunter through and through. I am going to try to force myself this year, even if it's just a doe, I'm going to try to pull the muzzle litter out some, but I also have never experienced where other people have done all the work that I've talked about. Right. And I'm, and I'm just coming in and for lack of a better term, I'm the hired gun. Let's go make something happen. All I have to do is execute the shot. Like, I don't know how that's going to feel. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely pumped about it and I hope it ends with a booner because you know, I'll be smiling like a little kid, but right. But yeah, because it's something I've never done before. I know Tom, you've done it a lot. I think Steve, you've you've done it some too. I've been there a couple um, times. Yeah, it's it's a never done it before. So the the one thing though, like for me, and I've done it a lot, and I'm not doing all the stands, you know, blinds and all that, but like there where I go. I go down like we were just down there. Was that last week? I'm even losing track. Was that last week we were down there or the week before, Steve? Last week. Week before. No, it was last what? week. Oh, God. I'm, <laughs> we're getting old. I'm forgetting weeks. But, uh, you know, we went down and we, we spread a bunch of seed. You know, I, I go down and, and put out mineral shed hunt the thing. So it's, I don't just show up. And, yeah. and I could see where, you, you know what I mean? Like how you're thinking that way. It, um, but you'll get there and you'll ride around and you'll, you'll kind of, you'll have some say, cause you're going to, you know, you have options on, on where you're going to hunt and what farm oh, yeah. and, and pick some spots. Um, it's, it's God, it's going to be fun. It's going to be <laughs> for sure. I mean, we, we have to hope for the weather to, to cooperate. Um, you know, the one year I went, the weather was horrible and it's, God, that just sucked. But um, every other year, if, if you have even average temperatures, you're you're golden because you have the food. Yeah, yeah. So you're in a situation where you're able to give them just a ton of food, high quality food, and right. come in from miles. Right. The one thing that it's been good and bad. Um, they're not, no one down there is seeing as many big deer. Um, moving around right now because they've had severe drought. Yeah. The the one thing I kept, I kept watching Facebook and, and looking, I was waiting to just start seeing people posting about EHD and uh, cause they've had it in that area and, and wiped out some just giants. I, I believe it's three different bucks on just farms that, that they have that were 200 inches or, or over died of EHD. So, you know, we, we definitely caught a break because I haven't seen any of, of that. I was going to uh, say, I haven't seen much. No. So we're going to be good there. But uh, I know we had a section of Indiana get hit so hard. The DNR changed the uh, quotas. Really? They lost a lot of deer. Okay. Yeah. And one thing, I don't know if you know this, but uh, during muzzleloader, you can bring your bow. Ooh. You can bring your bow. I did not know that was an option. I didn't think you did. And as soon as you said that, I was like, I, I don't think. Oh. Yeah. So you could. I, now, I, I'm. we're going to be sitting Whether they on, have a spot. You know. But you can. There's there's spots in the mornings where um, we we don't hunt our, our good spots where they're coming out to feed. Yeah. But we're we'll go back in the woods and hunt ladder stands where they're going back to bed. And you could easily bring a bow on, on those morning hunts. You're making this Hoosier smile over yeah, here. I'm, I I'm definitely going to have it packed in the truck. At least, even if I don't get it out, it's going to be there. I like that. Now, if it's like five degrees, I may not even want to try drawing it on an Iowa whitetail. But <laughs> we'll see. We'll have to look into that because if you can, um, I've shot some at, at pretty far distance down there, but I mean, one, I could have, if I had my bow, I could have easily shot him. He came all the way in to the bean field. Here's the joke that some of my friends say, 
if you had one shot at 80 yards and you gave Ty the shot, give him a gun or a bow, everybody jokes Ty's deadlier with his bow at 80 yards than his gun. <laughs> well, you better go practice some more. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> All right, Ty. Well, hey, thanks for joining us on the show today. Best of luck this season in Indiana and in your Iowa hunt. And yep. we hope to see your hands wrapped around some big antlers real soon. Right. You guys as well. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Ty. Loved it. Thanks for joining us on the Rack Factor podcast, presented by Rack Fuel Premium Deer Nutrition. Listeners of the podcast can enjoy 20% off Rack Fuel Premium Deer Mineral, Feed, or Food Plot Seed by entering the code FACTOR, that's F-A-C-T-O-R, at checkout. Visit rackfuel.com now for 20% off premium deer nutrition products and fuel your herd. <laughs>